Thank you to all of you who participated in the survey. Your feedback was invaluable. I was surprised a few times by the common interests and responses and especially appreciated those of you who shared your specific dreams and hopes of what you wanted to build. Now, obviously many of the projects you mentioned will be beyond the scope of this first module as the project involves aspect, aspects beyond analog electronics. But we will be going over those skills needed to do what you want throughout the model modules in the course. Uh, for example, one person wrote in with a cool little project saying they wanted to convert their washing machine from a mechanical dial controller to a digital controller. Okay, well let's take it a step further. To do that, you'll be using the electronics in this module and the digital electronics in the next module, part two of the robotics course. In fact, in the companion parts kit for the second module, you'll have multiple microcontrollers and a full color touchscreen. So not only will you be able to digitize your washing machine, you should be able to throw in a full color touchscreen digital control. The winner of the internet was the one who wrote in that they wanted to build a suit with which they could easily pick up cars. <laughs> oh yeah, I like the way you think. But the feedback from all of you heavily influenced what I covered in this module and how I covered it. It also inspired several free extra bonus lessons which I'll be producing and adding to the course. One of the surprises I got from the survey was your strong interest in high power control, including things like electric vehicles. Now, when I was teaching at the high school, we actually built an electric car. So I can speak directly to that subject. In robotics, we need to get into higher power control, but I'm going to focus even more intently on it here because of some of your feedback. And I'll add some bonus lessons later on for things like high power AC control. Let's say we've got an electric vehicle with a monster DC drive motor, or perhaps a tank track mobile robot with a big DC motor in it you pilfered from some scrap electric forklift. Awesome. You've already built a pulse width modulation circuit. So that's the hard part. It just so happens we managed to get a deal on a whole box of 2N 3055 high power NPN transistors. So I'm thinking, hey, I just put a whole whack of these transistors in parallel, drive them all from the pulse width modulation circuit. The motor takes 50 amps. These transistors are each rated for 15 amps. So I'll use four of them in parallel. And that gives me even a little bit of wiggle room because I should be able to handle 60 amps. Perfect. So I wire it all up. And then we put a pulse width modulated signal in. I wire it all up and fire it all up. All four of my transistors promptly and loudly turn into smoldering craters. What on earth happened? The problem was the use of bipolar NPN transistors. Now, while these particular transistors, the 2N3055, can handle a lot of current, and the idea of sharing the load in parallel is a good one in principle. You can't do this with bipolar transistors. This is because of load hogging. Now, you remember that I mentioned that every single transistor is just ever so slightly different. So let's say we have four NPN transistors sharing a load in parallel. Each one turns on at a slightly different voltage. This one turns on at 0.63 volts. This one turns on at 0.71 volts. Uh, this one at 0.74 volts. 
and this one adds 0 0.68 volts. So this one turns on first. Now remember, this is a PN junction, just like our diodes. It will never let that voltage go above its forward bias voltage of 0 0.63 volts. So if this transistor turns on, keeping the voltage at 6, 0 0.63 volts, so the other transistors never reach their turn on voltage. You now have a transistor rated for 15 amps handling 50 amps. It promptly melts and becomes an open circuit. It is now out of the picture. The transistor with the next lowest voltage turns on. Holding the base voltage at 0 0.68 volts and keeping the others turned off. 50 amps goes through a transistor that can only handle 15 amps and it explodes like Krakatoa. This one now turns on, keeping the other one off. 50 amps goes through a transistor designed for 15 amps and it explodes like Nakatomi Plaza on Christmas Eve. The last transistor turns on and it definitely can't take it either and it has a meltdown as well. You can have as many of these transistors in parallel as you want. You'll destroy the entire bank of them. This problem will also plague Darlington pair transistors, any bipolar transistor type, because of the NP junction controlling the transistor. So, you put a current limiting resistor to each individual base. So you put a current limiting resistor to each individual base, thinking that will help, and it does to a degree. But there's a second problem that causes load hogging. So this transistor turns on first and takes more of the load than the others because it is more forward biased than the others. Now they're all working together, but this one starts to heat up. When bipolar transistors heat up, they conduct more. This higher conductance means more current, which produces more heat, which causes the transistor to heat up more, which causes the transistor to conduct more, etc. You get thermal runaway. So this transistor melts down, no longer shares the load. The transistor with the next lowest turn on voltage goes into thermal runaway. It burns out, then the next one, then the last one. The solution is to put a resistor on the emitter. Now, any resistor will do, but they usually try to keep, uh, keep it to a very small resistance, like one ohm. If this transistor runs away, more current runs through this resistor more current through the resistor means it drops more voltage. But the voltage across the base emitter junction has just gone down. The base is still seeing the same voltage, but that voltage just dropped because this voltage here just went up. So this turns down the transistor's forward bias, keeping that thermal runaway under control. But this completely defeats the purpose of putting transistors in parallel in the first place. I don't know about you, but if I had it my way, I'd want this to be a, a wire going, connecting to negative straight to the motor, the lowest possible resistance I could get when it switches on to maximize the power applied to our electric motor. So this will work if you say, put in even a half ohm resistor in there. But if you ever do this, watch your wattage rating on your resistors. <laughs> You're gonna need some big honking resistors. There's a much better way. Use MOSFETs. MOSFETs can handle incredible current, have a very high input resistance, and they don't hold each other down. Now, sure, some will turn on before others, but you're going to be driving them to saturation anyway. 
So that doesn't matter. Also, look at this chart. This is from the data sheet for the MOSFET. This is the one you have in your kit as an example. Notice that the higher the temperature, the higher the resistance between the source and drain. So, of course, your MOSFETs are each going to be a little bit different. One will conduct just a little better than the others, so it takes up just a little bit more current. It heats up, which causes its resistance to go up. This forces the other MOSFETs to carry more of the load. So you just took a major step in avoiding thermal runaway. What you really want, though, is to overrate the MOSFETs anyway. If the MOSFET is rated for, say, 30 amps, try to run it at, say, 10 to 15 amps. Keep them cool. Make up for everything by putting bunches of them in parallel. Where it really gets complicated is when you're forced to run any transistor in a non-saturated state. It's more like a resistor. Uh, for example, in home power systems where you're generating AC waves from a large battery bank or an electric car with an AC drive motor. Uh, we'll get into more detail there later on. Typically for really high applications, you'll get transistors in this TO2 case. So you just get a big old heat sink. Usually it's just a big chunk of finned aluminum. Uh, don't forget your heat sink compound. Bear in mind that the case will be connected to one of the connections inside the transistor. You can get electrical insulation gaskets for these transistor cases. Uh, just goop on the heat sink compound on both sides of the gasket and make sure the bolts are electrically insulated. Or, alternatively, if it's okay that all of the transistors are connected together. Uh, say, for instance, the cases are the source on the MOSFETs. You can just bolt them all to the aluminum heat sink and then consider the aluminum block electrically live. You can then figure out if you need to electrically insulate it from the vehicle body or not. Now, keep in mind your operating voltage. If, if you're running at a high voltage, then it's probably best not to have the heat sink electrically live, just for electrical safety reasons. For reversing your DC motor, uh, you can build an H-bridge and build four banks of transistors, but that's expensive and a pain. I would suggest having a reversing relay or switch hooked up to your motor and then feed your, powered, your power pulse with modulation signal to the switching relay or switch. Just have a monster relay capable of handling the current. Uh, many cars have a separate starter solenoid, like many Fords. These are 12 volt relays, which can typically handle 100 to 150 amps and can be purchased or salvaged easily.